Shalom and welcome to uh, another Bible study. As uh, we continue, people, I had put uh, a prophecy uh, message of the sign of the Son of Man in heaven. I had uploaded to YouTube. I kind of run out of uh, time there. And uh, I want to kind of go back over and refresh a couple of things as, as I close with this teaching. Uh, now, this prophecy, of course, uh, that the Lord revealed to me several months ago, uh, I had been asking the Lord and praying because of the sign or what, what would this be? You know, you can think of lots of things, uh, be a cross or be the sign of David or the star or or uh, numerous things, uh, but when the Lord revealed this to me, understanding the resurrection of the dead, uh, saints there in Matthew 27, 52, which is prophesied uh, actually by the prophet Jeremiah, Jeremiah being a prophet uh, to the southern kingdom or to Judah, and Judah was only back, they were the ones back from captivity. As we know, the ten northern tribes never came back from captivity. And I have talked to you about that when Christ went to the uh, Jacob's well and met the Samaritan woman. Uh, and he told her that she had had five husbands. That comes out of Second Kings 17 chapter, uh, 1724 I believe it is. It's been a while since I've taught that. But I do have that prophecy, that teaching on YouTube. But the main thing on this, and I'm probably just going to uh, title this, uh, Continued the Sign of Son of Man for uh, Rabbis and Jews, Messianics, uh, of those people that are of Jewish faith. Because actually, uh, you know, when Paul speaks to us, uh, the Gentiles has been grafted in in Romans 11. One of our jobs, uh, people, is to show mercy uh, to the enemies of the cross, uh, which Paul speaks of, uh, those that uh, rejected Christ, his own received him not, and to provoke them to jealousy. So this whole prophecy in Scripture comes from uh, uh, their book, in other words, uh, uh, the resurrection of the dead saints, 144,000, was prophesied by Jeremiah in, uh, in Jeremiah 31, uh, 16, 17, 18. Now, I'm going to be using, I use a, a lot of different translations. Uh, when I'm teaching here in Tennessee, mostly I will use a a American Standard King James, uh, that's what most people have been raised with. I look at other uh, translations, and I, wanna, I was going to read these verses in this morning's study from the complete Jewish Bible, which a lot of uh, uh, converted uh, Messianic Jews uh, that uh, they teach... Uh, the resurrection and teach the uh, Christ as the Messiah and for other uh, Jewish people maybe that use the Jewish uh, Bible have not come to see their eyes are not open so hopefully maybe uh, if there is uh, those of Jewish faith that find us on YouTube or if some of y'all listen to this and you know some uh, Jewish people uh, Please send them to this so they can uh, watch this teaching. Uh, because this is, uh, you know, salvation came through or by the Jews. That's the channel God used. And, and that's how it's going to end up because uh, uh, he is still going to take away their sins. Uh, he, that's the covenant that he made with, uh, with the house of Israel and the house of Judah. So those that are by faith believe in Christ and are following the master. And uh, are trading the scripture, people. I, you know, so many people may never heard me or ever heard that uh, teaching to trade. Uh, Christ spoke of that in his parables. Uh, and he uses uh, money and talents and pounds and goods. Uh, but those are his pure words. 
that has been uh, crucified or tried in the earth seven times. It comes out of uh, uh, Proverbs there. So uh, we got to uh, we have we have got to go back to the front of the book and trade his uh, Torah and the Psalms and the prophets with each other. That's what he's looking for because when you do that then you see everything that's uh, wrote there in the end of the book of the New Testament, the Renewed Covenant, it complements. Now there again, I, one of the best definitions I've heard of so-called New Testament writings come from a, a believer, a rabbi of Jewish faith, a believer in the Messiah, and he said that the New Testament was the best commentary of the Old Testament. And I think that's brilliant because once you come to see that uh, he's fulfilling everything written in the Torah, the Prophets, and the Psalms, and he's got to open your mind to those scriptures, uh, that's their scriptures, see. The Tanakh or the Old Testament is their scriptures. Well, they, they used those scriptures uh, in the first century, the early apostles and followers. That's all they had. They used those scriptures uh, to win people to the Messiah. Now, uh, of course, we well, talked about uh, Matthew 24, and this, th these uh, verses I will re be reading uh, from the complete, they call it the complete Jewish Bible. Uh, verse uh, Matthew 24, uh, verse 3, when he was sitting on the Mount of Olives, the Talmudim, uh came unto him privately telling us they said when will these things happen and what will the sign of your coming and the uh, alarm or the ending of the age here uh, Yeshua replied watch out don't let any uh, fool you for many will come in my name uh, saying I am the uh, uh, the Messiah and they will lead many astray and then he goes down and, and he gives all the signs in which uh, most of you that study the Bible or follow prophecy, uh, you know that Matthew 24, Mark 13, Luke 21, Luke 17, uh, and also the book of, of Revelation is uh, all about prophecy. So they, here they said, what is the sign of your coming and the end of the age? Also that he, he recorded that all the stones or, or the these stones on the temple, the temple mount, all that would be destroyed. We know that happened in 70 AD. So it's very important when they ask him there again, the sign of your coming. Now, uh, as I said in the prior study, uh, I get very compassionate about his scripture because uh, we have been deceived. That's prophecy people. Uh, our generation was raised and uh, most of us in America belong to some denominational church or Catholic or uh, Protestant. And uh, you find out when you start studying the Bible that Christ said in Matthew 16, 18 that he's going to build his uh, called out assembly and the gates of Hades will not prevail But he, and him being head over it. So there's only one body. Now you got all these denominations and all of them profess Christ as their Savior. Uh, but none of them get along with each other. And see, we are supposed to be, uh, uh, the body is supposed to fellowship and we're supposed to be members one another in that same body through one spirit. And that's the born again spirit. And then, the, and then uh, God writes his new covenant. In Jeremiah 31, 31, he writes the Torah on our hearts. Now, most of us that grew up in America under a denominational teaching, you've never heard what I've just said. Now, if you have, you're very lucky. Uh, then you don't have to uh, get rid of uh, traditions that you've grown up under or doctrines of men that you have, uh, you and your grandparents and their grandparents and their grandparents uh, have been taught. So you're very lucky if, if you understand what the new covenant really is. Uh, it's renewed covenant through Christ uh, back to the Father and all those that believe or follow the Messiah have been added to him. Then uh, 
then he writes his law, his Torah, which Torah does not mean, uh, actually the Hebrew uh, definition, it means, uh, it has several meanings, but, but to me one of the most important is instruction. So you've heard of Christ's doctrine, you've heard of man's doctrine. Doctrine means instruction. So Torah is uh, God instructs us with his law. Uh, now, we're not under the law, so people that hear me, uh, if you want to cut me off because you say this guy is way out of bounds, we've been saved by grace through faith. Let me tell you something about grace. Uh, Noah found grace in the eyes of the Lord. So go back to Genesis 6. Grace, God is all. God is a, uh, a Elohim or Adonai of grace. He's always uh, showed grace and mercy. He's got an order, see. Uh, and of course, his judgments are first. Then mercy actually uh, triumphs judgments, people. James tells you that. That's the order. And in the faith of God. So God is the judge, and he's turned all judgment over to the Son. So the Son will judge every, uh, every creature in all nations. Okay, now... Uh, so we see that uh, that this sign is very important because the sign and the end of the age uh, go together. Now, uh, I want to drop down. Uh, let me go ahead and drop down in Matthew 24. Let's go to uh, 2430. And we'll, uh, we'll read what uh, the scripture says there. Uh Uh, to, verse 29. Let's look at Matthew 29. But immediately, now this is, a, this is the uh, complete Jewish Bible I'm reading out of. But immediately following the trouble of those times, the sun will grow dark, the moon will stop shining. Uh, now, see, Christ is telling you that the moon will stop shining. The moon stops shining, you know, every month. It doesn't give its light when it goes through the conjunction. When it uh, gets ready to start a new month, uh, then you'll have uh, the first sliver of the new moon, and then you'll see the moon start to shine. And then it will become full, then it will wane, and it will go through its process. Because that's the calendar. The moon was made for God's calendar. It wasn't made for the United States to send some astronaut up there and walk around on it, so to speak. I mean, a lot of people don't believe that happens, but... Nevertheless, that, that's not got anything to do with the moon. God created the moon uh, for a purpose, to record his holy days uh, and also the lesser uh, light at, at night, the stars and the moon. Okay, now we see that uh, in verse 29, the moon will stop shining, the stars will fall from, from the sky, and the powers in heaven shall be shaken. And this is not talking about literal stars, people. Uh, falling from heaven, uh, and this is the shaking and of the you know uh, the uh, the powers of heaven right now are the powers to be the principalities powers. That's what that's what we wrestle against. Uh, Paul says so. God's not going to cause his planets or his stars to. Uh, it wouldn't take much of a meteorite, as we know, uh, very small, if it hit the earth in the right place. It would destroy this planet. Okay. So then we see the very next thing. Then the Son of Man will appear in sky. All tribes of the land will mourn, and they will see the Son of Man coming in the clouds. That's plural of heaven and uh, tremendous power and glory. Then he will send his angels with a great shofar, which is the trumpet blowing, and they will gather together his chosen people from the four winds which we have been scattered from one end of heaven to the other. Now that word heaven, there again, is not talking about the third heaven. It's talking, we got three heavens, and I talked to you about uh, the air we breathe. We're going to be caught up to meet Christ in the clouds, in the air. Air there means uh, the air you breathe. Once you get out higher than that, uh, then you do not have any, turns real cold, you don't have any air to breathe, and you got to have your oxygen with you. And then, of course, the third heaven is way out beyond even uh, what uh, that we've even seen through telescopes. In other words, the third heaven is is uh, where God 
uh, resides. That's his home. That's where he's building the heavenly Jerusalem for us. And you notice in the end of the book, there's a new heavens and a new earth. And that does not mean a brand new. It's the same thing. Uh, we have 12 new moons there. Uh, most time it's recorded in a year's time. Uh, but it's not a brand new moon, is it? I mean, it's the same moon, but it goes through its stages and it renews its, itself. It goes through the cycle, just like you work six days and you rest on the Shabbat on the seventh. Then you start over the first day of the week, the second, third, fourth, fifth, sixth, rest on the seventh. So it's a continued cycle. Well, when God coasters the earth as he changes things, this earth, uh, well, when it says there'll be a new earth and a new heavens, uh, it's not something that's brand new. It's just been kosher. It's been given. It's been remodeled, in other words. Uh, and the same thing is going to happen uh, this time when he comes back because he is going to remodel this earth with the greatest earthquake it's ever been since Adam uh, was created. That's what John tells us there in Revelation 16 chapter. So uh, then at the end of the millennium, uh, he's going to kosher the earth again. He's going to zap it with fire. So, But he's not going to completely destroy the planet and start over. Now let's think about the covenant. Uh, he made a covenant with us at Mount Sinai. We broke it before Moses ever come down to give us the contract, give us the law. Uh, so now he sets up the rehearsals through his holy days, which he created, uh, to teach Israel obedience and, and also, God would visit them on these days uh, uh, of his uh, divine appointments. But they were only for rehearsals. They never were to completely finish the job of our transgression where uh, we sinned against uh, uh, the Creator. So, that, they were just rehearsals and the shadow of good things to come. They were shadows of good things to come which the Lamb would come and take away the sins of the world. So that now, under the New Covenant, we see, and I'll, we'll go there and read that. We'll read it from the Jewish Bible uh, in, Matthew, in uh, Jeremiah 31, 31. Now, so uh, back to uh, the Son of Man coming in the clouds, but, but notice the sign of the Son of Man will be seen first before they see the Son of Man come. There's an order there. So God is going to give uh, uh, the inhabitants of Judea and Judah a sign. And what is this sign going to cause? Uh, what is the effect of the sign going to be on uh, the inhabitants of Judah uh, or in Jerusalem? That's Zechariah 12, 10. This is, this is fulfilling Zechariah 12, 10 when it comes to pass. Uh, all the tribes of the earth uh, will mourn. And see, when you go to Zechariah 12, 10, it will mourn and then it will, it, it will reveal that they will mourn for the one they perished 2,000 years ago uh, as one mourns for its firstborn. See? And then they will see the Son of Man coming in the clouds. And that's witnesses. Uh, clouds is not the cumulus there. Uh, he's coming with or in the clouds uh, with tremendous power and glory. And he will send out his angels with a great shofar. See, that's the blowing of the trumpet, see, according to the feast days. So everything God is doing is fulfilling the scripture through the Torah, the prophets, and the Psalms. All his feast days come from the Torah. And you have the prophets prophesying that you have the Psalms recording it. Uh, so now uh, we see that this sign, which I had told you in the prior study, is the resurrected 144,000 children of Israel, which Christ raised from the dead 2,000 years ago as his first fruits. Now what greater sign could there be because the sign of, of the miracle of Jesus Christ is not only he died for our sins on the cross, and was buried and rose the third day according to the Torah, the prophets, and the Psalms. But when he came out of his tomb, those dead saints that were asleep, that were sealed by the Father, and were killed by Herod, 
uh, which is a type of Satan. But remember, remember in the parable when Christ said, don't fear the man that can kill the body, just the body. But fear him that can destroy both body and soul in Gehenna. See, so now, but when Christ told the Sadducees that don't believe in a resurrection, he said you err in scripture. Now what scripture was he talking about? The only scripture they had, the Tanakh, or the Torah, the prophets, and the writings of, of Psalms and Solomon. He said you err in that scripture. You don't know the scripture. Or the dunamis power of God. Because he's the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Not the God of the dead, but the God of the living. Why? Because he is the uh, God of the resurrection. None of the other pagan gods, do you not think the Hebrew, when, when Moses led uh, uh, the children of Israel uh, out of Egypt, and, and what was turned on Pharaoh when he said, I'll kill all the firstborn of the Hebrews, and Moses said, well, you, you know, you've really messed up now because God is fixing to use that as a, as a tenth plague. And uh, the death angel, and they had to put the blood on the, on the doorpost and, the, and overhead there. And a lot of the Egyptian babies were saved because they did that, followed what the Hebrew people were doing. But the ones that didn't, they died. And look what Pharaoh, even some of the old movies that you watch, Ten Commandments and... Uh, some some of that is good, some of it's not. Some of it's not by scripture, of course. But look what they did. They tried to use their gods uh, to raise their children from the dead. But that, that because they are the gods of the dead. That's why that was quoted uh, out of Exodus, and that's why Christ brought it up to the Sadducees. You don't realize uh, that God is the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, the God of the living, the resurrection. See? And so that's what it's about. It's about the resurrection. See? He made Adam from the dust, and the second man from heaven is spirit, and we are quickened by his spirit, uh, and it's now the spirit that gives life, and the blood, and life is not in the blood, so to speak, because we're going to go through this uh, corrupt body must put on uncorruption, and this mortality must put on immortal once this change is made. And of course, when he resurrected his uh, first fruits 2,000 years ago, this is a sign they're going to see, because when they see that, they're going to know that he's the one they pierced. Because they, it, it, the resurrection of him and the first fruits have been covered up. Now, what I'm, what I'm, what you got to understand, uh, uh, as this is really a message, it's a message for all, but it's really a message to the Jewish people, because that's who he's going to uh, open their eyes and they're going to mourn when they see uh, the resurrection of the redeemed of Jacob people. See, God's always had his first fruits. Now, I don't have time to get into it right now, but when you even study the feast and you Jewish people or you Hebrew teachers, you know that uh, the first uh, harvest or barley was unleavened. Christ was unleavened bread, but when you understand the resurrection of the 144,000 children uh, that Rachel was weeping for, you understand also, they were, God sealed them, and Herod killed them, and they were in a holy hagios, set apart, innocent state. They had not come to the accountability. Now, we are tied to that same resurrection, and we are, we are the early summer harvest of the wheat, but the two cakes that was offered to Yahweh as acceptable uh, first fruit offerings from the wheat harvest. Notice they, they had fine flour oil and they had uh, leaven in them because we are sinners. We had come to the accountability. They had. So when you come to under see that, see that you even see why the first uh, uh, seven day uh, feast there 
was to get the leaven out of the house. Uh, uh, but see, his first fruits were unleavened people. Uh, they didn't even know, they, they didn't have no guile in their mouth. They were virgins, as the Bible said. They never took the mark of the beast. They didn't, uh, 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 they didn't follow the beast. How can I say that and, and be with authority of the scripture? It's because when they were killed by Herod at two years old, uh, they couldn't even speak a language yet. I mean, they couldn't even talk back to their parents yet. See, that's why the Bible states that. That's a literal interpretation. That's, uh, that's not something that's uh, out there spiritual people. They, uh, they was not even weaned fully because some of them was one even a month or two or three months old. They were killed, two-year-old males and under. So who else could, what else sign would God give to his people? What, what other sign or miracle could it be but the prophecy of Jeremiah, uh, J, uh, Rachel's children she is weeping for, that God sealed and marked with an earthquake just like they marked the shocks of barley and, and then they harvested them and then they brought in the best of the young and, and give it to the high priest to make a wave offering. And... Uh, so these were the first fruits. And, and John tells you in Revelation 14, uh, these are the first fruits redeemed from earth to Elohim and the Lamb. Redeemed means fully paid for, purchased. How are they fully paid for and purchased? By the blood of the Messiah, the same way that uh, we have been bought with a price. But them being unleavened, uh, and there again, when Hannah or Anna was the second witness in uh, Luke 2.36, and she uh, came to Joseph and Mary when they brought Jesus for the sacrifice of the two turtle doves, right after Simeon had prophesied, Hannah or Anna, depending on what uh, translation, you, or like the Jewish Bible has got Hannah, uh, the King James uses Anna, the Greek word, uh, or translated from the Greek to Anna in the English. Uh, and the Bible says she was a great age. And she, her father was Penuel, and she was from the tribe of Asher. But her son being Samuel, because you got to go back to 1 Samuel to find her. And that makes her what the Bible says is a great age. Now, when you go back and go back to 1 Samuel, you're going to be shocked to see how old this woman is. And I know there's people out there that laugh about that, but that's you. You got to go study your scripture. Uh, you know, if you find her anywhere else uh, besides in First Samuel, uh, when she uh, made an oath with God, if He would give her a son, she would turn it right and give it right back to the temple to be raised in the temple of God as a man child. That's in First Samuel one eleven. He's called the man child, and in Revelation twelve, Christ is called the man child. So, uh, you, you know, you've got to see the similarities there. Uh, and also Samuel was weaned uh, from nursing, and then she turned him over to the temple at, in that holy, innocent age there. See? Uh, so when you start to see this, uh, and you understand this is a sign that's going to be given to the Jewish remnant uh, in Jerusalem to fulfill Zechariah uh, 12, 10, 11, and 12. It's prophecy, people. And and he's given us the time factor. It's after the tribulations, after the witnesses are killed. Um, it's between the three and a half days that they lie dead before they stand up on the Ruach and they stand up on their feet and a voice comes out of heaven, come up here. Now, uh, that's the resurrection. This is all happening during that time. Now, but when you come to understand that, you will understand this is why this message is really for my Jewish brothers. Whether they are still uh, enemies of the gospel or whether they're believers in Christ. Because they're going to be given this sign. Uh, and then they will mourn. And then they will be granted grace and supplication by the Father. 
because they are beloved for the Father's sake, and they will be grafted back in uh, to their natural olive tree. Uh, that's prophecy, people. And, and God does not break his covenant, because Paul tells you there will be a deliverer coming out of Zion uh, that will take away ungodliness from Jacob. What is ungodliness of Jacob? That they don't believe in their Savior. They don't believe in their Messiah. See, he will take away that and because he says, uh, Paul says, he made a covenant uh, and he will take away their sins. That's the, that's the covenant, the new covenant. Now we're going to go to that uh, and we're going to read that. And we'll read it from the Jewish Bible. So let's go, uh, let's go to... Uh, uh, Jeremiah 31. Uh, yeah, let's go to Jeremiah. Take me just a minute to get over here. Uh, Jeremiah 31, 31. <clears throat> okay. Or let's, let's back to the 30. Uh, Here the days are coming, said Adonai, when I will make a new covenant of the house of Israel and the house of Judah, or Yehuda. It will not be like the covenant I made with their fathers on the day I took them by their hand and brought them out of the land of Egypt, because they, for their part, violated my covenant. Even though I, for my part, was a husband to them, Uh, says Adonai, for this is the covenant I will make with the house of Israel after those days, said Adonai, I will put my Torah within them and write it on their hearts. I will be their God, they will be my people. No longer will any of them teach the fellow community member of his brother, no Adonai, for all will know me for the least of them to the greatest, because I will forgive their wickedness and remember their sins no more. Because they're going to rep recognize uh, their Savior. See, that's what's going to bring him back. And it's all going to finish at the end of the age. Because God is going to give them the sign of the resurrected uh, 144,000, 12,000 from each tribe of Israel. Uh and then they're going to immediately, when they see that sign over their heads, uh, just like the, uh, the uh, miracle or the sign or the covenant that God made with Noah in the ninth chapter of Genesis, what was the sign of the covenant he made with Noah and all flesh? What, what was that sign? It was the rainbow. Where do you see the rainbow? Over your head. God doesn't change. Uh, so he's going to give, show them the greatest miracle, of, and there's there's going to be 144,000 uh, children of Israel uh, with immortality coming from heaven with him, uh, and they're going to see that brightness over their heads as he has turned this whole earth dark, and then that's going to appear. Uh, be illuminated over their heads and that's when they're going to uh, uh, mourn for the one they pierced and repent and God's going to uh, grant them grace and supplications when they see the sign because he made a covenant with them he is not going to break his covenant now for some of you Jewish people if this is this is this is your creator this is uh, your God Adonai and now it's being revealed in uh, the Gospels, in Matthew 24, which a lot of you uh, Jewish people, uh, and some of you know that Matthew 24 was even wrote in Hebrew. So what, a, what an unbelievable revealing of, of God's word now to provoke some of you to jealousy. Now, will there be a remnant that will not believe over there in Jerusalem and, uh, and the inhabitants thereof? Of course. But when they see this sign, 
they will believe. And God will keep his covenant and, uh, and he will forgive them of their idolatry, their wickedness, and he will remember their sins no more, just like us that have been grafted into the commonwealth of the household of Israel. Uh, we now follow the Messiah. We are part of the Messiah's body. We are waiting on uh, the resurrection of the wheat. We are uh, the kind of first fruits there in James 1.18. And uh, we trade his scripture with each other. The Torah, the prophets, and the Psalms uh, is what we do. That's what we're supposed to do. And if you're doing that and you're following uh, the Torah, the prophets, and the Psalms, then that's how you can uh, witness and, show, and, and, and they will obtain mercy through your mercy. Uh, because they rejected uh, and they're in unbelief. Uh, but that's, that's why Paul said what he did. For years I always... I wondered, well, how in the world, I don't know any Jewish people, but if I did, how can I talk to them, how can I witness to them about the Bible? You can't go up and say, uh, well, I belong to this church, and I want to tell you about my Greek Jesus, and, and I celebrate Christmas on the 25th of December. Now, I know some of you probably don't like that, and, and I'm not trying to uh, be mean when I say that, but that is an absolute fact. Uh God destroyed them because of tree worship, partly. And Baal worship, it's all the same thing, idolatry. So if you think you're going to win uh, a Jewish uh, person to accept your Jesus, that's the other Jesus I talked to you about. Their, their Messiah is the king of the Jews. He is the king of Judah. You see, And we have been grafted into that household. Uh, and when their natural branches that have been broken off are grafted back in to their natural olive tree, what does Paul say? How glorious is that going to be? How glorious a day, people, is that going to be when God gives them the sign of the resurrection of the 144,000 children of Israel, the redeemed of Jacob? How glorious is that going to be? How much glorious could it be? It's indescribable that God is going to show them that sign and he is faithful with the covenant he made with many. For one week there in Daniel and all these people are running around about this other covenant and stuff and God made his covenant and we broke it but he is faithful because uh, Christ is still going to save his people from their sins. And it's only by God's mercy and grace that he turned to the nations for this gospel to be preached to us and for us to become a believer, be quickened in Christ by the Spirit, be made alive in Christ by the Spirit, and be grafted back in so we can be part of the kingdom. So we inherit the kingdom, not as the bride of Christ. I know some of you are not going to like that. But what did Christ say in Matthew 13 in his parables? Let the wheat and the tares grow up together. The harvest is at the end of the age. Let the wheat and the tares. He didn't say anything about the barley because the father had already prepared a, a wedding for his son. If you understand that parable, it had already been prepared. They were laying in the ground and had been dead for about 30 years because Herod killed them and Christ was going to raise them from the dead as his first fruits. And his bride, why do you think in the scripture it says, and the spirit and the bride say, come. We are not the bride. We are what Christ said we are. The wheat is the children of the kingdom. The tares are the children of the wicked one. When you study that and go back to the Old Testament and study that, uh, what Solomon says, and you do a study on the bride of Christ from the old to the new, understanding the resurrection of the dead, the 144,000, you will see who the true bride is. But that's okay because we have to be conformed to the, to the sun. We have to have our white linen on to get into the wedding. Uh, and we inherit the kingdom 
we inherit the kingdom of heaven with his bride, with him being the husband. But what does a bride and a husband and the wife, what do they have? They have children. And so we are the children. When John looked at him and said, I am a friend of the bridegroom, and the bridegroom has his bride. He wasn't talking about us, people. All of this that's been hidden now is being revealed. Now, uh, I didn't mean to get, get on that. I do have a teaching on the bride of Christ also on YouTube. So we see now that this is the new covenant. And we see... Uh, that he said, I will put my Torah within and write it on their hearts. Now, how does he do that? When he sent the Holy Spirit. That's why Christ told Nicodemus, you got to be born of God's Spirit. you got to be regenerated. you got to be reborn or regenerated by the Spirit of God. Then, by his Spirit, you having the Spirit, you can be led by the Spirit, and then he writes his uh, laws his scripture on your heart and then uh, when that happens as a witness as we trade the scripture then we also trade that and pass that on to like-minded people and that's how uh, the gospel gets spread uh, to all nations and then it comes back to Jerusalem now when you look out here and see all this other stuff you got to remember, in that day, many are going to come and say, Lord, Lord, look what I did, prophesied, cast out devils, and done all these great works for you. And you know, Christ never said, you didn't do that. You know that? He didn't say they didn't. He just said, your work is of iniquity. You're Torahless. What, what, now, what is the new covenant? He'll write the Torah, the instruction on our hearts. Uh, but see, he didn't. They. He never knew them. They were never born again. You got to understand. There's another spirit, another Jesus, another gospel. This is all being revealed, people. That's why you're to examine yourself. The Lord's coming. We got to repent, but because the kingdom of heaven is nigh at hand. It's been two days, 2,000 years once it started. Now it's going back to Jerusalem. They will get their sign. They will repent. And then uh, the Lord is coming in the clouds with them and his resurrected wheat harvest to set up the kingdom. And that will fulfill uh, Daniel's prophecy. Seventy weeks are determined for thy people. Who is thy people? Who was Daniel uh, a prophet to who? What, what what was Daniel doing in Babylon? What was Jeremiah doing? Uh, his uh, uh, contemporary, what was he doing? He never left the poor in Jerusalem, and Daniel was uh, in Babylon. But they were both prophets uh, to southern Judah, or to Judah. See, and this is how it's going to end up, people. So, uh, seeing this new covenant and seeing what he said, I mean, this is undeniable. Now, I know uh, most of you here, now, for these hopefully uh, Jewish or rabbis or whoever the Jewish uh, or Jewish faith, it doesn't, uh, but, but you follow the Old Testament. Hopefully, some of you will hear this and your hearts will be pricked because this is what the message is for. Yes, it's for all of us that's been grafted in uh, because this this fulfills uh, our understanding of prophecy. Now, what it's going to do, though, when you understand this, whether you believe it or not, your rapture theory is dead in the water, people. I'm not trying to beat you up because you've been preaching the rapture and teaching the rapture and all that. But you don't understand the resurrection of his first fruits. You don't understand the holy days. Uh, you're not teaching uh, the new covenant by the Spirit. He'll write the Torah uh, on on your hearts. It, you're not trading uh, the five talents, the two and the one that He's delivered to His uh, His goods uh, to His servants, and and you're going to be uh, rewarded according to that. But if you are trading that, then you will understand what I'm talking about, because that's where all this comes from. You see. So, uh, you know, God's fixing. Now, this is the shaking of the heavens. 
see. Now, I'm not trying to make any of you people out there on YouTube mad because of your rapture theory. But you got to realize that the New Testament so-called church apostles that God chose as they sit on the Mount of Olives, the whole discussion was about his coming, not our going. That's the whole discussion, people. His coming is second advent. There was no other coming because uh, the resurrection of the dead in Christ that rise first, that is to fulfill the feast of the Lord. That is not a secret rapture that you're going to be raptured out. You just don't understand his order. He's already resurrected his 144,000 first fruits. If you do not believe that that was great, great tribulation in Israel when they slaughtered those holy innocent babies and some of the uh, ancient writers said it took three and a half years for Herod to uh, kill that many. I believe that. But now you've got to understand on Simeon's prophecy that that miracle that Christ did after his resurrection, Simeon prophesied to Mary before any of this ever happened. He was filled with the Holy Ghost and said this miracle will be denied, covered up, and disputed. So if y'all, some of you, email me, uh, my email should be there, and you're, you're, you're welcome to email me. Uh, that's fine. But when you email me and you tell me that's impossible, you don't believe that, that's fine. All that's telling me is how true the Bible is. Because it's been covered up since the first century. Matter of fact, it, the cover-up started on Resurrection Day, 2000, almost 2,000 years ago. See? So that's that. There again, I said if I could sit down with an atheist and I showed him that prophecy and how, and, and it doesn't make a difference, he believes in God, but it, to see that that great prophecy has been covered up from the get go, and he could go research and listen to sermons hundreds of years ago of believers. Or profess Christ, and none of them teach the resurrection of the dead people, plural masculine, that Christ, those graves that were open. Many, great number, Polis and the Greek. It's not out there. But you know what? There again, the prophecy now is this has to be restored before Christ comes. You see? And God is restoring it. And when the two witnesses stand up, they will give their testimony then it's going to look as bleak when they are killed, just like the holy innocent was slaughtered, just like Christ was crucified. But why did Paul say if the princes of this world in 1 Corinthians 12, 1, I believe it's 12, 1, I, I know I get mixed up a little bit where the scripture's at, but I know exactly what it says, that if the princes of this world had known the outcome, they would have never crucified the Messiah. See, but when they did, then that started a new creation. And now everything's going to be fulfilled. See, it's not like they wouldn't, but Paul is making that statement. He's making the statement if they had known, they would have never, never done that. They would have never put him on the tree and crucified him. Uh, see, because even the apostles didn't understand Christ was going to be raised from the dead. And some of them didn't even believe it after his resurrection. So it didn't really take large money to cover it up. Some of his own followers had a problem with that. But what pleases God, people? What is the only thing that pleases God? Without faith, it's impossible to please God. So by faith, through his word, and being led by the Holy Spirit, this is why I'm bringing this to you, because I believe this. And they will see this sign. Now, uh, I've got, got off on uh, on that. I wanted to go uh, in the Jewish Bible. I want to go to where this prophecy actually was by the prophet Jeremiah. So, so we will just back up a little bit here. In uh, uh, Jeremiah 31, 
Uh, let's go to 31.15. Just, just back up a few verses uh, from 31.31 to 31.15. Now, the Jewish Bible records this in translation in this way. Uh, this is what Adonai says. I really like that. Lots better than the other translations because this is what God says. Now, if you profess to believe in Jesus Christ, uh, then Jesus Christ and the Father are one in their uh, authority. There, in other words, in their teaching. In other words, uh, actually, Christ was being conformed to His Father's image. We're being conformed to Christ's image. If I'm conformed to Christ's image, He's conformed to His Father's image. Then we are one. And John 17:17, 17, 17, one for, and uh, when uh, John reveals, when Christ says, "These are mine, uh, and and you and I are one, and you and I and they are one," that's what He's referring to. And in, in the Spirit, we're one. See. Because the spirit can't be broken, and there's only one spirit, and that's God's spirit, and that's truth. Okay, now, so in the Jewish Bible, it records here, this is beautiful. This is what Adonai says. So I say we need to believe what he says here. A voice is heard in Ramah, lamentating bitter weeping. It is Rachel weeping for her children, refusing to be comforted for her children because they are no longer alive. Now, if I was to ask you, and if you've listened to any of the recordings on this, you'll know. If you uh, move to the Renewed Covenant, Matthew 2.18, the same scripture is recorded there. 2.16 tells you why they're no longer alive. Matthew 2.16, because Herod put out a degree to kill all the two-year-old males and under. Children, Rachel's children. Now, understand this. Why is this such a, a great message uh, for the Jewish people? Because guess what? Uh, now, don't get offended uh, out there when I say this. I'm not talking about Jewish getting offended. I'm talking about uh, you people that think you have replaced, uh, the church has replaced Israel by your theology. Are you kidding me? If anybody, you, you need to hit your, you need to hit the deck and repent immediately. Because you're not obeying the good news of the gospel of the kingdom according to the scriptures. Uh, you come up with your, your gospel, your good news. Now what I'm going to say is, Christ did not resurrect any Gentiles. You realize that? They were sealed, 12,000 from each tribe, from Judah, plumb through Benjamin. Now, I'm a grafted in being a Gentile. I've been grafted into the household of Israel. I am no longer a Gentile either. But uh, I was not from one of those tribes, people. Uh, and you're not either. See? God sealed those uh, children that Rachel was weeping for, which represents the 12 literal tribes of the ones that he sealed in order, not according to how they come out of the womb. Because Reuben was sealed second, but Reuben was the firstborn. But Reuben messed up. But Ephraim is not even mentioned. Joseph is. Dan is not. And see, uh, but you know, Ephraim, if you go to Genesis 48, 19, you'll get one of the greatest uh, revelations that you can get about Ephraim. And Ephraim was known as the 10 northern tribes, that's true. But guess what? Ephraim uh, ended up uh, being involved with the five husbands, which Christ says to the Samaritan woman, which is recorded in 2 Kings 17, 24. Go read it. You'll see the five nations or the five husbands that come in and uh, intermarried and uh, took into captivity. And that's why we worship all these, uh, we come to worship all these pagan gods and stuff because God cast us off. He rent us, he tore us. Now, the point I'm saying to you and all that, Genesis 48, 19, 
when Jacob crossed his hands uh, and he blessed and Joseph got upset because uh, Manasseh was he was wanting to get uh, the, the firstborn Manasseh being firstborn Ephraim secondborn and he crossed his hand and blessed Ephraim because Ephraim is recorded in Genesis in the Torah 48 19 for Ephraim's seed will become the fullness of the Goyim the Gentiles that's me and you see if God hadn't have done this and you see how God's uh, judgments and mercies are past finding out now, uh, this might be way over your head. You might not understand what I'm saying. That's all right. But that's the reason why Ephraim, there was not 12,000 sealed from Ephraim. But there was 12,000 from Manasseh. Because Ephraim's seed is all of those people that come through the tribulation or the great tribulation. They cannot be measured or numbered because that's why the gospel goes to the nations. And his sheep hear his voice and come to it. See, it's unbelievable what God now is revealing. It's just amazing. But now, real quick, before I run out of time, uh, in verse, uh, uh, the next verse in the Jewish Bible, it says, This is what Adonai says. Here is the second prophecy of Jeremiah 31 15. So, this is what God says now. Let's see if we can, by the Holy Spirit, uh, reveal this to us. <clears throat> this is what Adonai says. Stop your weeping. Dry up your eyes, for your work will be rewarded, says Adonai. They will return from their enemy's land. Now, they were killed in the land of Israel, but who, who had jurisdiction over the land of Israel? Who had jurisdiction over the land of Israel when Christ was crucified? Who had jurisdiction over the land of Israel when Christ was raised from the dead? Who had jurisdiction over the land of Israel when he raised these many saints that were asleep, which is Rachel's children here? And the prophet is telling you, don't weep anymore, Rachel. Dry up your eyes. Now, how could that be, people, when these children were beheaded and she was weeping because they were killed now, how in the world could could Adonai say in in this towards the scripture like this? When Adonai speaks, don't weep anymore, Rachel, because they're going to come again to the land of the enemy, and they're going to be rewarded. How could that be, people? Matthew twenty-seven fifty-two and the uh, fifty-one. The graves were broke open by a great earthquake. The temples rent top to bottom. The walks are in, and the graves broke open, and many dead bodies of the saints which slept, Rachel's children, come out of the tombs resurrected after his resurrected, after his resurrection, talking about Christ. And what is their reward? They are the first fruits redeemed from the earth among men, first fruits to God and the Lamb. What a reward. A redeemed 144,000 children of Jacob, Rachel, not Gentiles. But guess what? Because of, of Judah's rejection of the Messiah, Paul tells you they are the enemies of the gospel so the Gentiles can be grafted in. That's why he tells you when the fullness of the Gentiles come in, people. Then... He is going to give them the sign and the deliverer coming out of Zion, when they see the sign, they're going to be granted great and supplication of prayers and he's going to come, on, come and save them, not only from the, uh, the beast and the enemy, because he's going to destroy Satan with the brightness that's coming in the spirit of his mouth. His word. So he is coming to save them from their sins and to set up his kingdom because he will not break his covenant with them to take away, the. this is the new covenant, when I will write it up on uh, their, the Torah on their hearts uh, by the Spirit and I will 
remember their wickedness and their iniquities no more. I will take away their sins. I will remember them no more, people. And he's going to keep his covenant. Because he is the God of Abraham, 